Welcome to this episode of the Essential Church Podcast, an ongoing conversation about some of the most important issues facing the local church today. I'm your host, Andrew Arndt. This is episode two of season 13, and in just a couple days here in sunny Colorado Springs, we're going to be hosting our annual Essential Church Learning Community, and we're gathering a group of 70 or so pastors from around the country to talk about the ministry of the Word, the art and the craft of preaching and teaching. It's going to be a great couple days together. We're so looking forward to it, and we thought with that on the horizon, uh, we might use this as an opportunity to talk some about the art and craft of preaching and teaching. So in the upcoming interview here, I actually sit down with my colleague at New Life East, Rory Green, who's the associate lead pastor with me, helps me lead the church over there, to talk about some of the elements of good preaching. It winds up being a really fun conversation between the two of us, and there's also a really fun announcement in there right towards the end that you want to pay attention to. So, without further commentary from me, here's to the interview. Well, listen, friends, this is episode two of season... I, did we establish this last week? It is season 13. It's, yeah, it's, thir- yes, it's a middle school child. 13. That's it's a middle school child, and it's a little unruly, but it's coming into maturity, and mm-hmm. that's really great. So we're holding out that in hope. In three look, seasons, it'll be able to drive. Oh, that's true. So we and don't have to worry about it in anymore. In five seasons, it will be able to vote and so on and so forth. I thought it'd be really fun today to have a conversation about preaching and teaching just to tee us up some. And we've had my colleague Rory Green on the show a couple different times. And Rory has reminded me recently (laughs) that I've never actually given him a proper introduction. Like, Where's my 15 minutes? That's what I want, you know? Now, go. No. (laughs) But I want to provide a little bit of context for Rory. So Rory came to our New Life East staff a couple years ago. He was at a church down in Texas, Mm -hmm. fixing maybe to plant a church. I said fixing because it was down in Texas. Yeah, I I would have said the same thing. And it just didn't quite work out for a number of reasons. But this is a guy who's got lead pastor, senior pastor, teaching ability like all over him. And so we were so grateful to bring him on our staff because I was really looking for a guy at East Mm -hmm. who was like kind of a jack of all trades. And it's been so fun to have him there. We've watched his preaching and teaching ability grow in the last couple years. And he also is really a student of the craft. And so Try to be. Rory, do you want to tell us like a minute or two maybe <laughs> about yourself? And also like, maybe it'd be good for people to hear, how did you discern a call to preach? Where did that come from for sure, you? Sure, sure. Andrew, you are so kind as always to give me compliments that I do not deserve. <laughs> um, yeah. So my wife, Brooke and I, we are both uh, Midwestern natives like yourselves from Illinois, not Wisconsin. You're from Decatur. Decatur, oh, Illinois. Oh, yeah, of Ferris Bueller fame. Yeah. Yeah. Well, she's listen, not here. She went away to Decatur It's got to be famous for something. That's and right. if it's going to be that, we'll, yeah. we'll take it. Um, we spent, as you said, we spent the last, you know, we spent seven years of our life in Dallas-Fort Worth on staff at a great church there. And uh, we were. We were discerning the call to plant a church. We knew that leading at a high level was, was next for us. And uh, we found our way here to New Life and to Colorado Springs. We have family here. And... Um, we love being in the Pikes Peak region mm. of this great state. As I think about like preaching for myself, I didn't become a Christian until much later in life. So I didn't. I grew up like church adjacent most mm-hmm. of my life. Um, Rory got saved last week at New Life. La- East, so, <laughs> yeah, I got yeah. last baptism weekend actually. <laughs> um, uh, um, my, you know, my grandmother grew up going to like the biggest uh, Assemblies of God church in the city that we grew up in, and mm-hmm. my mom grew up in a Lutheran church. And um, I, so I found myself always like around church, but I didn't really have faith until I became, I was like 16, 17 years old, junior, senior in high school. And I, uh, I graduated from this really small private Christian high school. My graduating class had 15 kids in it. Um, were you the valedictorian? I was not. I'm not going to tell you where I graduated. Tor- I'm not, any Torian at I'm all? not going to tell you where I graduated. <laughs> <laughs> I graduated 16 out of 15. 16 out of 15. Um, <laughs> But we, so we would do like chapel every, you know, every week at our school. And the last chapel of every year was like the seniors did all of it. And so that my senior year, our class, all 15 of them, 14 of them asked me if I would be the one who preached at our senior chapel. And uh, my life was not sanctified at, in any way, shape or form, <laughs> should not have been the one asked, um, but found myself preaching at our senior chapel at this church that we would do our chapels at. And I remember preaching 
I had this idea of could we find a bunch of garbage out of dumpsters and put it all over the stage? Mm. And all the guys in the senior class were like, that's a brilliant idea. We should go dumpster diving for garbage and bring it and put it up on stage. Yeah, so why we not? did. And I preached this 20-minute message about how God somehow sees the junk of our lives and what he does is makes it into something beautiful. This is what he does. Did you make something beautiful out of the junk? Or did I you didn't, just, you know, but, but I was like... But you could but imagine God, God, God doing God it. God could if he wanted. <laughs> the illustration left a little bit to be desired. Um, Good instinct, though. So that was like that was like my first time ever doing what you call preaching. Yeah. And I remembered doing it and getting off of like the platform and thinking to myself, that is like the greatest feeling I have ever had. Wow. And I don't love people like paying attention. I don't love all eyes on me. That's not my thing. We've talked about that recently. Yeah. <laughs> I don't love that. So it was a bit of a weird thing to be like, mm. I really enjoyed that. But that was like my first time getting into preaching as an eight, 17, mm. 18 year old. And I was just like, we should do this for a long time. Mm. So I end up, you know, going to Bible college, getting into pastoral ministry, and preaching has become the thing that um, I love all aspects of church ministry and everything, but preaching is like the thing that my like yeah. heart gets excited about. Well, you're really good at it. You're so I have, I have Rory preach one or two times a month for me. It's been really fun to watch him grow, and he's just on the front edge of what he's going to be as a preacher, and he's already really good. So tell me, Rory, uh, when you think about what you have come to value as a preacher. Mm. Maybe like, what are the three big values that you bring into the pulpit when you preach? Like what, what drives you? What shapes, what shapes your messages? Sure. So I, I think, um, I want to try to talk about the, the most awkward and difficult parts of the text. Mm. Um, I think about even like a message I preached a couple weeks ago, where we were talking about the, the building, the architecture plans for the temple, basically. That to me was like the greatest challenge because I'm like, we get to talk about the measurements of a building and how that somehow is going to make sense in our lives today. Yeah, like the part of the Bible where people's eyes glaze over a little bit. Yeah, I'm like, no, that's actually really fascinating. We Mm. should do something with that. So that is a piece of it. I love um, the storytelling humor uh, anytime I can pretend I'm a comedian for five minutes on stage mm-hmm. and try to like make people laugh. Mm-hmm. Um, I think there's plenty of science out there that if we can get people to smile and laugh yep. for a couple seconds, yep. that all of a sudden their brain is engaged in a completely different way. So now the hard thing that they weren't willing to hear three minutes ago, they're now willing to like mm-hmm. consider and yep. ponder. Um, so I think those two things, I think the third thing, and this has been new for me, is I think I bring like a, um, I have a, a great deal of discernment when I'm on a platform now, which I don't think I had even three years ago. Hmm. I think being in like the charismatic stream mm-hmm. of church has opened that up where I'm not, even the way I write sermons now, I'm not writing very clear endings or even very clear transitions as I used to, because those used to be, I used to be one so want to be so precise. Hmm. Now I'm more going, this is a moment where I'm going to look into the room hmm see people, see their stories, see their faces, and discern whatever it is the Spirit wants to say next. I think those are like the three things Mm. I'm trying to like bring into a space now Yeah, um, that I feel good and secure about. I love that. I know you've got some things that you want to talk about on this episode, but I got one more question that I want to play your way. Let's go. I love all three of those things so much. Uh, What's the thing right now that you're like, I wish I was better at fill in the blank, or I'm trying to grow at fill in the blank. And oh. maybe you've actually alluded to it in the in the things. I don't know. Uh, no, I, I have an easy answer for that, though. It's And it's something you do really well, which we can talk about in a little bit, but it's it's precision. Mm-hmm. Um, I think like, I think with athletes, I think there's this, when they go from, you know, one level to the next level, what you see in them is like this immense precision with what they're doing. Yeah. Like, no step is wasted, no movement of the body is wasted, no mechanics that they're doing is wasted. And I think with preaching, I think the thing I'm trying to figure out how to be better at is how do I grow in the precision of what I'm saying, Yeah, how I'm saying it, Yep. having a better answer to why I'm saying it. Mm -hmm. Um, Because I think that ultimately is what can kind of like move a sermon from being good mm. to being great mm-hmm. is have you is every word that is coming out of your mouth thoughtful and like thought through that's mm-hmm. the thing precision mm-hmm. for me okay we've previewed then a little bit what we're about yeah, to yeah, talk yeah. about so i'm i'm going to i'm going to tee you up here okay. then by asking rory you know what is it in your mind 
that like what are the elements that make up an effective preacher or an effective sermon? What what have you seen in your time preaching and your your study of the craft? Yeah, I think I think I've just I've tried to be a student since I realized like man, I I preaching is this is brilliant. I want to figure out how to do this. Well, I've just tried to be a student of everyone that I sit in a room with. So I think for me, I'm and I'm sure we could expand on this list or even narrow it down or whatever. I think I've noticed there are like five spaces or five characteristics or qualities that show up in someone who is like a brilliant preacher. So the first one that I think about, and none of these are going to like blow anyone's mind. It's just maybe going to put some language and stuff. Like the first space is is preparation. Mm -hmm. So how do you prep? So for me, when I think about preparation, I think like the the first test of a great preacher is not what they do on the stage, but it's everything they've done before they've ever gotten up there. Mm -hmm. So it's it's how are you engaging with the text? How are you studying? How are you asking questions of the text? Um, someone that does this really well is uh, a guy named Steve Carter that we mm -hmm. have, have as a mutual acquaintance. Steve, Steve has like challenged me early on, like ask close to a hundred questions of every text. A hundred. Get as close to a hundred as you can. Wow. And some of the questions feel like childish and trivial as you're asking yeah. them, because if you've preached or studied the Bible for any amount of time, you have the answers, but ask as many questions of it as you can. For me, this is also about like, this has to do with cultural awareness, the awareness of your people as you're preparing, like, are you thinking about what is going on in the room before mm. you ever even step up there? Mm. So Andrew, I've seen you do this. I've, we've talked about your prep. Right. Um, because everyone does it slightly differently. I'm curious, like, what is, when do you know, like, you're doing some studying, you're reading the Bible, you know the text you're about to preach out. When is the moment for you where you're like, I know what I'm preaching on now? Uh, I yeah. figured it out. I've yeah. like cracked the code on the sermon. Yeah. Well, we at New Life, I think some of our listeners will know we share like a preaching calendar. So I always kind of know what the text is going to be that I'm yeah. wrestling with. And that's, we've kind of set that as a team. But I think I know that I've kind of cracked the code on, oh, okay, this is it. This is what this sermon is going to be about. When I'm doing my study and I feel a resonance with some mm. piece of the text, and it's not just here. So it's not just like I'm intellectually interested in it, but in my spirit, something awakens mm. in me. And so when I'm reading the text of scripture and I get that kind of curious hum off of a moment, maybe similar to what you talked about, where you're like, what's the weird thing in the text? And you kind of are like, <laughs> you gravitate towards sure. that, but that might actually be an indication of the gift of God in you, yeah, that God has set you up to see the stuff that can't normally be seen in scripture so that you can lead people into it. I'm just trying to pay attention to those things. And I think I used to feel a huge burden as a young preacher that if I'm mm. tackling 12 verses of scripture, my sermon has to be about, I got to make sure that I've covered the waterfront mm. of what's happening in the text. And I just, I think a couple things have come home to me over the years. One is that I just think that the text, to me, the text of scripture is like this, any text of scripture. And it doesn't matter if it's 10 verses, one verse, or two words in a verse. Mm. All of those are like doors that mm. you can open up and step into the infinite world of the mystery of God, which mm. means that you'll never be able to plumb the depths mm. of any given text of scripture. That's the first thing. The second thing is like, I plan on being at this for a long time. <laughs> So if I'm preaching on Psalm 23 and there's like one thing yeah. that's really important to me, I'm not going to finish that message and be like, gosh, dang it. I wish I had more time to tell them about all of the things that are there. Right. Be for the reasons that I said before, you could never do that. And right. also at some point in the future, I will be back on Psalm 23 and it will have a new kind of resonance given mm. where I'm at and where the people are that. So I'm going to preach that message at mm. that time. And I'm not going to feel any kind of burden to preach that message now yeah. because what needs to happen right now is whatever that resonance is. And I do think that that resonance lives at multiple intersections. Mm. It's sort of like, what's what do I notice happening in the world? What's happening in the congregation? What's happening in my heart? And I want to pay attention to that because that's where I think messages get gravitas. Yeah, I think what you're saying is interesting because I would imagine there are people who have been who have gone to seminary or, or Bible college, been taught about preaching, and the the way that we get taught is like the text has a meaning. Yeah. The text has a meaning. The goal of a preacher is to find the meaning. Yep. And it's it's like you it's a universal law of hermeneutics or yep. whatever. Yeah. But what you're saying is slightly different. Yeah. Which is that like 
every text has like the God given truth in it. Yeah. But there's like, it's the like diamond, right? Every time you turn it, right. there's something different. There. I mean, I think it's what's interesting is that I think evangelicals are the ones who are going to be most steadfast in saying there is a meaning in the text right. of scripture that's authorial intent. Right. You know, <laughs> this writer was writing for this purpose, and you're not going to be able to get into what's happening there unless you really divine what that purpose is. Right. And I totally agree with that. Sure. I just think that that's not the highest rung of the ladder. Right. I think that that's actually the bottom rung of the ladder. Mm -hmm. The first rung of the ladder is I have to get into, if it's Psalm 23, Right. I want to get into what David is thinking mm -hmm. and how David is seeing this and what does David intend. But we also, as evangelicals, we believe that the Spirit recruits the text of Scripture, mm -hmm. the ultimate author of the text of Scripture is the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, unlike David, is not dead. Mm. The Holy Spirit is still recruiting this text of Scripture to do things that David could never yeah, have foreseen, right. and so I need to be attentive to that. I think that's where a good sermon lives. Yeah, and I think that all I think that all ends up then showing up when you get on a platform, right? Mm -hmm. It's the the prep that flows into it. So the, these like five things that I've noticed, they all have a flow to them, and they're in an order for yeah, a reason. Right. So if if you move from preparation, these are not going to all be p words. I know some preachers out there are like, I was hoping some they Baptists would be p are getting words. really excited yeah, 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 right yeah. now. But the second thing that I think about is presence, which. Yeah. For me, when I think about presence, what I'm thinking about is that the greatest preachers have a clear sense of security and confidence when they're in front of people. Mm. So this for me, like the question of presence is how do you act on a platform? How do you find your voice? How do you know who you are when you step on that? Yeah. And I know what we all say is like, you you are, you want to be the same person mm. off the platform as you are on it. But there is a slight difference mm -hmm. in that one, you're projecting your voice, you are like you are presenting a massive thing to a crowd of people. Mm -hmm. So it changes. I even think presence for me is like, are you open to an audible on the prep that mm -hmm. has been done? Are you open to changing it? So Andrew, I, we talked about this a second ago. I think one of your best qualities is precision. Mm -hmm. Like no word for you and you preach is ever wasted. And I'm mm -hmm. not just saying that to you because you're my boss. <laughs> no, <laughs> like no word is ever wasted. How have you figured out how to do that? Because hmm. I don't know how to do that. Hmm. I say way too many things way too flippantly. How yep. have you like cultivated precision when you think about preaching? Boy, that's a really interesting question. I I think, first of all, I've always loved words. And my mom would tell if we had my mom sitting here on this podcast, she'd say, yeah, he just always kind of had an ear for the profound hmm. Like big words, I liked playing with big words when I was a kid, and I liked them because they sounded good in my ears, mm -hmm. but I also liked the fact that a word carried something and it did something. Mm. And so I've always kind of had that, an appreciation for words, and that's always given me kind of a love for poetry and story and different forms of literature. And I think that makes you better as a preacher. Mm. I think it just gives you a sharper sense of how language works. So that's one part of it. But if I, I'd be interested if I had some time really to think about this, uh, what, I, what I might say. But the other thing that just comes to my mind is there's a, a for me, there's a paradoxical quality to the precision. Mm. And it's this, that if I focus too much on the precision, I've got to get this just right. Mm. I actually will not be as precise or as powerful as I could be in the oh, pulpit. Oh, interesting. As if I focus on what's going on with these people in front of me. And so I've told people, because I think as human beings, we're wired for connection. Mm -hmm. And I think when we establish connection, our best intelligences come out. And so when I go into the pulpit, I've done lots of preparation work and I know the things that I'm trying to say. And I've done some, I've got little practices to try to make me more precise. But when I get into the pulpit, I'm not focusing on precision mm. so much as I'm focusing on presence. Mm. I want to make eye contact. I want to make heart contact. I want to make sure that we sense that we're connected with one another. Mm -hmm. And my assumption is that if we do that, I'm going to be, be my best version of myself. You're going to be precise by default. I'm going to be precise mm. by default because I'm less concerned about how do I do this thing? And I'm more concerned about our connection and what's happening there and the things that I need to convey to you. And it'll almost happen by second nature. And I think that that's the way that language works, mm -hmm. you know, that if you start thinking about your talking while you're talking, mm. it like derails it. But if I think about messages and communication and think about even that word communication, it has the word communion in it. Mm -hmm. What you're trying to do in any act of communication is establish communion. So yeah, if I focus more on the communion, mm. I'm actually get the communication right. Mm. And I think what that leads to 
and this is not just my way of making a nice segue to the next point, but I think it's true, is it leads to you as a speaker and a pastor having like real authority in someone's life. Yeah. Because they, they, I think it's that moment where they feel seen Mm -hmm. because you're not, it's those moments when preaching, when someone comes up to you afterwards and was like, I feel like you were talking Mm. to me. That's Mm -hmm. what precision ultimately leads to. So the third thing that I've noticed in all great preachers is they have a sense of authority. And Mm. when I say authority, I don't mean they're like dominating the the platform. That's not what I mean by that. The way that I define it is, is the anointing of the spirit and the authority of the son are clear and evident in Mm. your preaching life Mm. and in your private life. So it's like the it's the what some people would just refer to as character, but I think it's more than that because I think what flows from that character is then God has like trusted you with something. Yeah. So what you're doing in preaching, I, C.S. Lewis, I have this quote written down that I think is spot on. C.S. Lewis said, when a layman has to preach a sermon, I think he's most likely to be useful or even interesting if he starts exactly from where he, he is himself, mm. not so much presuming to instruct as comparing notes. Uh, and I think that's what authority ends up looking like. You yeah. and I have talked about this all the time. Yeah. For you, preaching is a little bit like show and tell. Yeah. Talk about that for a minute. Well, I think at its core, preaching is bearing witness. And we can only bear witness to what we have seen and heard. Right. And so I think this is especially useful for young preachers, although you could go wrong with it, mm. that you have to be able to tell about what you have seen and heard of the Lord. And I don't want to preach it unless I've seen it and I've heard it and it's been true in my own life. Yep. Now, the burden then that comes to you is that you can't just tell your own little story. You still, It's still the story of God mm-hmm. that you're trying to hold. But I think the starting point is just the simplicity of like, I have met Jesus, the same Jesus that's talked about here. I've met him. Let me tell you about that. And I think that's disarming for people. I think that you can win trust with people. But I also think there's a growing authority that comes from who we are Mm -hmm. as we continue to walk with Jesus. And I remember hearing this when I was a young preacher, and it was both highly depressing and motivating at the same time. But an old preacher of a prior generation, E.M. Bounds, once said, that it takes 20 years to make a message Mm -hmm. because it takes 20 years to make a man, you know, or a woman. It takes 20 years to make a mature Christian. It takes a long time. And I've noticed in the preachers that I respect the most, part of what you respect to them is not just like, wow, they're such good storytellers and they're exegetically precise, but you're like, there's a human. Yeah, you're real. Yes, there's a human behind there that has lived a long obedience in the same direction. They have authority to say these things because they have been into they've been into the depths. They've been mm. in the secret places with God. And so I think that authority, if you just live with God, your authority is going to come out. And then your authority doesn't have to be wielded in any kind of a angry harangue. It's not kind domineering. Of way. Yeah, it's like my kids, you know, I've got three teenagers and I've fought really hard to be present with them and to be a man of integrity with them. And so it is so rare in my house mm. that I ever raise my voice. Usually if I do, it's in jest almost, you know, it's like, <laughs> rah, 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 you know, and they kind of know that I'm half joking, but it's like, but mostly when I see things that are askew in my home, because I've won that authority with mm-hmm. my kids, integrity for a long time with them, I don't have to do much more then like put my arm around them and go, hey, bud, mm. I need you to do this right now. Or this thing that you just did, that wasn't right. And I don't have to put the pedal to the metal because they trust me and they've seen that. So I think that those things like give you authority. The other thing I think that really gives you authority, and most pastors I think need to do a better job of this, is just getting to know your people. Mm. When I'm deep in the lives of my people and I've made the hospital visit or the home visit or the house call, or I've been with them when everything was falling apart, when I, get up, when I get up into the pulpit on Sunday and I start speaking, they go, that's a person worth listening to mm-hmm. because he gave up his Friday night to be with us when our world was exploding. So I, those things I think help give a preacher authority. I'm curious what you've noticed. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think there's something, I, I think about young preachers who are, who are finding themselves 23, 24, 25, who have been given some opportunity but are doing the thing you talked about where they're sort of like, they're wanting more authority than what we they probably had. Yep. I found myself at that spot at 25 yep. where there was the like, the talent is there, yep. the gifting is evident, but it, it takes 20 years to make a man. Mm-hmm. So like you're, you can try to rush the process. I think that, I think the thing that has formed me the most as a preacher is the, 
is the gift of a moment when you step off a platform and no one flocks to you Hmm. to tell you that you just changed their life. Hmm. Because those are the moments that you actually have to like, you actually have to be okay without any spotlight on you. Yeah. The spotlight was great five minutes ago when you were standing on a platform. Yep. Who do you become when no one tells you that you have like hit a home run? Mm. And how do you then go, that actually doesn't dictate my identity now. It Mm. doesn't dictate my self-worth. Because I think when it does is when you get preachers who are like, well, now I've got to like one-up whatever I've just done. Mm -hmm. And they're playing the one-up game with themselves. Mm -hmm. And I think your soul eventually rots out Mm -hmm. if you do that long. I mean, I think that's the story we've seen in the Western church, at least over the last Mm. 20 years, is people who like... They strive to do the next best thing. Yes. You strive for more platform, more yes. spotlight. Yes. And your soul can't actually handle it. Yeah, you can't. I don't think that you can go into every Sunday with an expectation that it's going to be a home run. I think that's going Correct. to. I think that that's going to kill you. I just think that it's, it's unsustainable. Uh, Daniel Grothy and I have joked very often. This is a sports reference, but you know, <laughs> Tony Gwynn, Hall of Famer. I mean, he got into mm. the Hall of Fame hitting base hits. Yep. At whatever his lifetime average was, three twenty five or something like that. And so there are so many Sundays where, where when I get done and I go, that was a base hit. We just yep. kind of kept it going. Yep. We read the Bible together and I invited we the church about to, it. and we <laughs> talked about it and I invited the church to trust Jesus. Yep. Great. Good job. And I do think if you feel this pressure to like every Sunday has to be amazing, I think that you'll, I certainly think that you'll spin out over time. And I, to totally. me, like so much of the invitation is just to be like, to just be non-anxious mm. and be where you are. And one of the things I've seen with young preachers is this sort of discomfort. Like let's say you're 25, 26, 27 and just getting started. There's a discomfort about being 25, 26, 27. You have to prove something. You got something to prove. You want to show, you want to have, uh, you want to show that you belong there. And sometimes that can become like either you become showier than you should be. Oh, sure. You get like a false kind of gravitas about you, you're, it's just a little bit too much exegesis and commentary and all that. Because you're trying fu- to prove that you're, it's this you're, weird tension. You want to prove that you're smart and you belong. Yeah. But everyone wants a humble servant leader. So then you're caught in this weird gray space right. of, I'm really smart, but I'm not really smart. I'm, it, And I don't think anyone can survive in that. I don't no. think you can succeed in it. I think that you should just be honest about where you are. Like, I love what you did this past weekend at New Life East. You preached this brilliant message on kind of the furniture of what was going on in the temple and all of that. And, and it was wonderful. And your exegesis was great. But then what I loved was towards the end, you started telling a story about your two little kiddos. <laughs> sure. Huck and, Huck and Maisie, and it gave us this window into your life, and you're 30 years old, right. and you're not pretending to be 45. Right. You're being a 30-year-old right. man of God who is trying to handle the text of Scripture responsibly and then showing you a glimpse into my life where it is. And so we go, well, that works for me because that's true. Right. That's where, that's where he is. He's not pretending to be something right. that he's not. It's so not made up. It's not a facade. Right. And so that's where like the, it, it takes 20 years to make a message because it takes 20 years to make a man. That's where that can actually trip you up. You go, well, I could never preach or I have to pretend. And you don't have to do either of those things. Right. Show up as the person you are and the integrity that you have and the life that you've got with God. And I, that will resonate with people because it's true. Totally. Totally. So to, to keep sort of moving through this, the next thing, and this is the fourth thing on purpose, is what I call content. Hmm. This is this is when your prep work like is then put in front of people. Yeah. So the way I think about content is ultimately that your your content is important. It's the fourth thing on this list, but it's important because it is what people will write down. Right. And it is what they will remember. So it has to meet them in the moment that they find themselves in. Yeah. Your content is important, but I certainly don't think it is ultimately like the thing that makes or breaks you. Mm-hmm. But the, the, the key of it for me is great preachers figure out how to take all the prep work they've done yep. and turn it not into a college course, yeah. but into a sermon. Yeah. And I think those two things are like, I think they're drastically different. So Andrew, the question I have for you when I think about content is you're a writer, mm-hmm. but you don't exactly like write, your, you don't manuscript your content out like, oh, I'm going to say this at this point or whatever. Yeah. How in the world are you taking all this like prep, this space with God, this like, uh, you know, the anointing that you're holding yep. 
and then you go, this is what I'm preaching. Yeah. How is it translating? Yeah. How's it's it funny, falling down the funnel? The, the, the comparison with the writing is an interesting one, and it just made me think about how different I am as a writer versus a preacher, although sure. it might be that the two things are related in more ways than I realize. But as a writer, I'm an obsessive reviser. Oh, like I would, rev- I would revise, I would revise anything that I've written as long as I could possibly revise it, and unless what is the, there was a deadline. What's the revision look like? I just keep going back over it and going. If I tweak this word, that's back to the precision yeah, thing. Yeah. If I tweak this word, if I move this paragraph, if I edit this thing, the message will come out a little bit better, or even more. I love good music. This will sing. Mm. And I almost, and I said, you know, like my love for words initially was just that they sounded interesting yeah, yeah, to yeah. me so I can get it to sound better. But when I preach, I don't manuscript. When I preach, I go up noteless. I go up with my Bible. Sure. Now, what I've done ahead of time is I've created basically a series of prompts okay. that help me move through the content in a conversational way. And are, you, what, are you typing those prompts out? No, I write them, them I, listen, out. Listen, man, I'm old school. I got analog watch here, Android phone, uh, and I'm a like I'm so a pencil analog. Yeah, but continue <laughs> or whatever. I'm a pencil and paper guy. So like for me, it'll be like an eight and a half by eleven sheet of paper like this that I've written a few things on, maybe twelve to fifteen things. And I've got some arrows kind of pointing around. It's basically like a mind map. Okay. And it helps me know this is the journey that I expect to take and that I expect to take my listeners on. And what's nice about that is that it allows me to be intuitive when I'm with them. So as I'm moving through those prompts, I can be more focused on how they're responding to it Mm. than the precise thing that I was hoping to say here. And I think it makes the sermon just a little bit more fluid. Not everybody can do that. I've got a bit of a photographic memory, so I can pull that off. But what switched it for me, I used to be a manuscript preacher a long time ago. Okay. And what switched it for me is I started realizing if I'm sitting down in a conversation with Rory Green, for instance, over coffee, and uh, we're kind of getting into the details of my life, what I don't have is a manuscript in front of me that includes all of the information about my life. (laughs) So that when you ask me about my kids, I go, I have to go, okay, now, no, no. Where is two, that? Paragraph section two, four. paragraph four. Okay, Ethan. Ethan is 17 years old and he's a senior at blah, 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 blah. I don't do that. Right. What I have is I, I know those things intuitively. And so what happens is your question becomes a prompt for me okay. to speak out of the things that I know. So what that means then is that I have to study well enough to really know the things. And then I set up my own prompts that take me through the 25 or 30 minutes that constitutes that constitutes a sermon. So let me ask you this. Did you when you decided to do that yep. versus manuscripting? Cuz I'm sure there are people who are listening to this who are going, "Man, I manuscript. I really would love to get at the very least I would love to get away from my notes a little bit more." Yeah. Was that like an overnight switch you made? Uh, I switched from I switched from manuscript to kind of my, I was like, well, that seems scary, like jumping all the way away from it. Sure. What I could do is I could do like an extended outline. Okay. And maybe that'll help me. But that even felt too clunky because what happened was I felt like the thing that I was trying to achieve, which was constant sort of contact with the congregation, I was losing by looking back down. Sure. And so eventually I went, I've got to find a way to boil this down even more okay. and then just devote an hour at the end of the week really to committing that thing to memory mm. and then going up and just letting it letting it fly. So I'd say that process took six months, maybe nine months to kind of make that full switch. Of consistent preaching, sort of subtly changing it through. Yeah. I think that's, I, I talk to people all the time who are like, I really want to not preach with my notes, but yeah. they write full manuscripts. Yeah. And the only way I ever figured out, I don't preach without any notes. That that's t- I'm not doing that. My wife actually won't let me do it. She's like, when you <laughs> preach without notes, it makes me scared. And <laughs> so I keep something up there with me. Yeah. But it did take like, I think for me, it was similar where I used to be full manuscript because the churches that I were a part of, that was just how it worked. Yeah. And then I moved to like detailed outline. Yeah. Now it's basically like a one sheet yeah. of 10 or 12 things yeah. and the transitions that are in it. People have to do it, I think, in a way that's consistent with their personality mm. and also their comfort level in front of people. But what I have noticed is that the great preachers know how to do that thing that I was talking about, which is that you're transcending, in a way, you're transcending just your preparation, and now you're in a moment with people. Yeah. And I think about um, I think about Pastor Brady here. I think about Daniel Grothy. Yeah. When I look at their notes, they have they both each of them have different styles on how sure. they handle their notes. The notes, though, are just getting them into it. Right. The notes are not the it's end all, be all. The notes are not actually their sermon. Right. 
the sermon is whatever happens between them and the congregation. The notes are like the trampoline yeah, yeah, yeah. that gets them jumping into the congregation, into the wind of the spirit, you know? So I think different preachers have different ways of doing that. My way of doing it is noteless, but I think you got to find the thing. And it was a mentor of mine said it to me years ago when I was a young preacher. He was like, Andrew, I was fresh out of seminary. And he was like, Andrew, your preaching is good. It's really good. Hmm. He's like, you handle the text great. You clearly know your theology, your church history, your exegesis is solid. You could feel something coming around the corner with this Yeah, no, I knew, I knew it was coming. He was like, okay, there's a, there's a moment of coaching coming there's here. But, but he, said, he said, you know, the great musicians, the great worship leaders, actually he made the comparison to worship leaders. He said, the great worship leaders are not standing up there with their guitar, looking down at the sheet, at music, the sheet music in front of them and just executing it. The great the great worship leaders have so committed that to their souls mm. and they know it so well that then they can actually lead eyes mm. wide open and they're paying attention to what the spirit is the doing. And you get that moment of connection, that moment of transcendence. That's what takes it to the next level. And he said to me, I think your task in the next season of your life for your development is to figure out how does Andrew Arndt do that with his preaching? Mm. How do you transcend your notes so that you can actually get into a real genuine preaching moment with people? And I think it's when we do that, that allows us to do what I think is the last thing that all great preachers do, which is they engage in creativity. Hmm. Um, I, preaching is fascinating to me because it is both a science and an art, mm -hmm. meaning there is like certainly a formulaic way that you can engage with preaching. I think the best preachers figure out a formula that works for them, but it's also like it is art at its best, yeah. right? I've heard people say it's, you know, it's guerrilla theater. It's mm -hmm. you're, you're doing all sorts of things at once. When I think about creativity, um, I recognize that the greatest preachers push the boundaries on the methods and the mechanisms that they use to communicate the scriptures. Mm. They push them. Creativity is last on this list, though, for a reason. Mm -hmm. I've, seen, I've seen pastors who are both not considering creativity at all, yeah. so they are like dry as dust just reading. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've also seen people that creativity is the primary thing, right? and what they say then lacks almost any sort of depth. Yep. For what it is, I have a friend of mine who um, he told me his his lead pastor used to every Saturday night after his sermon was done go into his garage and look for a prop, just any <laughs> prop, and he would yeah. show up and it would like not some weekends it was brilliant because that's what preaching with a prop sometimes does, and sure. then other weekends it made zero sense and it was very obvious that the night before he had gone into his garage yeah. and found a prop. Andrew, how does like not the creative flow of writing necessarily, but how are you thinking about creativity when you're pre when you're writing when you're getting ready to preach? I hope I'm living a creative enough life mm. that um, just through reading and the exercise and writing and the exercise of my creative gifts that it just comes through and maybe the artistry just of the sermon mm. that I'm getting better at the turn of phrase. I'm getting better at being precise. I'm also getting better at using the quote from Augustine, you know, it mm. used to be that, or C.S. Lewis or whoever, it used to be that <laughs> it was just like, I needed to lend credibility to my sermon. And so it was like block quotes, you know, yeah. I think I've gotten better at being like, actually, you don't need all 17 lines of this. You need one. You need the one line and mm. this is the line. And so you get it more precise. Um, so I, I think, I'm, I hope that I'm living a creative enough life that it's making my sermons Fresh, because I think that is what we're gunning for. I do also sometimes I will think, I mean, I, it's a funny story that you share about the pastor, like Saturday night, go yeah, to the yeah. garage, where's the prop? <laughs> but I could do, I could stand to do that more, more. probably mm. of just that five minutes of like, is there something tactile mm. that I could do that could help drive it home? Because I do think that it opens the text up for people. I remember one thing I did years ago was I was preaching on, uh, I was preaching on Genesis 1, and how the creation, um, God embeds the miracle of creation in the creation itself. So it's sure. not just that like, God is like, let there be cows and there were cows, but God embeds the potential for more cows, more cows. in sure. the creation itself. I was like, how do I make this point? I was like, oh, I've got it. And so I got up and as I was preaching, I had a peach, a nice, ripe, juicy peach up on the platform with me. And I'm like telling the sermon. And I remember, <laughs> I remember going, hey, just excuse me. I didn't eat breakfast this morning, but if you'll just indulge me. And I start eating the peach as I'm like telling the story. And you could just see 
the question of he was like, what, what is, is that? He doing? What is he doing? And then when I finally got down to the point, I had eaten the whole peach and I went, you know, what God could have done is he could have just set the world up so that creation happens over and over again by divine fiat. Mm-hmm. I said, but instead what he's done is he's embedded the miracle of creation in the creation yep. itself. And I said, in this peach pit right here, what we have is the potential for infinite peaches on planet earth. Mm-hmm. And so God somehow gives his life to us in that way. And I heard about that sermon forever and ever and ever <laughs> from people because it was so tactile. So I think that's the thing I could actually grow in. I, what do you do for creativity's sake? I mean, you actually recently at New Life East opened a message in a way that I went, oh, look at that. That's a guy thinking out of the box. Tell about that. I think, uh, yeah, so the message, I it was, um, it was the passage in 1 Kings where, you know, Solomon is gifted wisdom. And then these two women bring one baby to him and are like, one of these is ours. He, his job is to figure out which one it is. Yeah. And the way that I did it was I just essentially cold opened the sermon, telling the story without anyone knowing that's the story I'm telling until we were far enough into it. Yep. I, I think the... I think the thing I've had to trust with myself is if I have a moment where I'm right, I'm getting prepping a sermon, and I think to myself, you know what you should do is just cold open and tell the story. Mm-hmm. I just need to listen to that. Mm-hmm. Like I, I think, um, I think so many pastors. I think this is fascinating about preachers because we are, we are people who create. Like yep. inherently, we sit down and create things, yep. but we do not believe we are creative. Right. We are we sit down and write things, but so many pastors are like, I'm not a writer. Yeah. It's so interesting. In no other stretch of the world would we be like, I create things, but I'm not creative. I write things, <laughs> right. but I'm not a writer. Right. I think part of being creative is trusting yes. like the inner creative part of you or the spirit, whatever you want to sort of label that as, that when you have the moment that goes, well, this should really, we should do something with this, is to just try it. Just do yep. it. So I... For me, it's, I think, just going, if I read a text and something pops out, do it. Mm-hmm. I, I preached a sermon not long ago, too, where I, it was the, you know, the log in your eye versus the speck or whatever, where I, like, held a log in my eye for 20 minutes of the message. Mm-hmm. And the point was that if you have, like, a beam in your eye long enough yeah. and you keep swinging it around, yep. you hurt people, you hit people, like, it, yep. whatever, that's what it creates. I thought of that... It, that was like a Saturday night. Oh, you should do that. So mm-hmm. I just went to Lowe's, bought a beam, mm-hmm. and brought it to church the next day. Mm-hmm. And everyone was like, what are you doing? Mm-hmm. And I was like, I don't actually know, but we're just going to do it. <laughs> yes. Um, I think that's the thing, is you just listen to it if the thing sparks, Yeah. and you go with it. And if you're going to be creative, you're going to embarrass yourself at some point. Yeah. Like, you're going to get it wrong. Yeah. I, Andrew, I would ask you to think about, like, the pastors or preachers that are listening to this who are going, I want to be more creative. I'm not sure how to do it. How do I like, how do I start being creative? How do I get the creative flow going in my life? Yeah, maybe what trust that you're already creative and it might actually make you more creative. Mm. I like what you're saying. Like you make sermons like you, uh, every week. You're an artist. <laughs> right. So just trust that and then trust your instincts a little mm. bit more. I can't tell you how many times I've been puzzling over a sermon mm-hmm. and I my little prompt that I'll give to myself is like, what is the thing that you need to say to yourself or you need to say out loud that mm-hmm. you're not saying right now? Or what's the point of frustration that mm-hmm. you have over the sermon? And I'll just kind of go, bah! and then you go, well, that's it. That's the thing that's that you're thing. supposed to do. Okay. So that's actually the beginning of the, the sermon here. So if you can find a way, I think, to get honest with yourself, what you're wrestling with and what you're seeing and trust it more, yeah. I think you'll just naturally be. But if you, if you make creativity the end all be all of it, or you set out to try to be creative, I think it just comes across fabricated. Yeah, that's when you're you're riding a zip line in from the balcony to yes. make a point about yes. Jesus having someone lowered through the yeah. roof or whatever. Right. It's like be yourself. You are creative. Just yeah. trust it. Just do it. Yeah. It's so good. I, so for me, when I have like paid attention to preachers over the last, I don't know, 15, 18 years of my life, these are like the five things yeah. that I have recognized when I listen to a great sermon, I'm like, that was great. Yeah. All five of these show up somehow. Yeah. These are the things. Yeah. Okay. So this is a good segue then, because part of the reason that we had this conversation is we're trying to tee up a new little initiative within mm-hmm. the Essential Church kind of network. Yeah. And uh, it's called the Preacher's Lab Podcast, yeah. inspired by Rory Green. Rory, tell us <laughs> tell us about the Preacher's Lab Podcast. Yeah. So I think I, when I came to you and we were talking about this, I recognize that there are not just young preachers here in our spaces, but there are preachers 
young and old all over the place. We're trying to get better at this thing yep. um, and are looking constantly for spaces to figure out how to do that. One of those spaces is learning community that's coming up here in a couple of weeks. But so what we're doing is launching the Preaching Lab podcast, and it sort of sits under the umbrella of the Essential Church Network. This is a now like a, a – we're housing stuff. This is mm-hmm. beautiful. This is cool. Mm-hmm. Um, but for us, when we think about what the Preaching Lab is, the Preaching Lab is a space where we can talk about the art and science of preaching with some of the world's best communicators. Mm-hmm. Um, and it is going to be a space where we don't just sort of talk 30,000 feet about preaching. We're going to do that. We're also going to try to answer the questions of how do we get better at these five things, these like five elements of preaching? How do we grow in them? How do we expand in them? So it's going to be awesome. Um, It is going to be able for you to subscribe and follow and be a part of it. Um, probably when this goes up, hopefully. And yep. then our first episode will come in just a couple of weeks. Yeah, and we'll, main- and we'll maintain the normal Essential Church podcast conversations, totally. theology and shop talk and yep. all that stuff. But this is really dedicated space to thinking about the art, the craft of preaching and yep. teaching and slightly longer form conversation yeah. as well. So we can be a little bit more leisurely in talking about the craft. Totally. Right? So if you find your, if you're listening to this and you're like, man, that's me, I'm a, a preacher, I'm a teacher, or I'm someone who is trying to grow in that space, this would be a great space for you to hop in, follow along with us. So if you enjoyed this conversation, look out for the Preachers Lab podcast. Hey, remember to register for the Essential Church Learning Community coming up in a couple weeks. Can't wait to see you there. As always, thanks for listening.